into the lesson today, we're going to talk about that very issue of the problem we see when we don't recognize who God is. When we decide that perhaps I can be God or know a little better than he does or dare to get angry with him because things aren't going the way we want it. We have to be very careful that we don't get in a position where we think God owes us anything. Mm -hmm. uh, because that changes the total relationship we have with him. And then we don't elevate him. We exalt ourselves instead. So that's dangerous. So Father God, we exalt you, we praise you, we recognize that in the deepest, darkest hours, in the midst of the storm, that you are there. Like Jesus was in the boat, and not only that, you made the waves. You're the creator of the waves, you're the creator of everything, Lord. And so we come into your presence praising you and glorifying you because of that. We lift up each of these precious people who need your healing touch, who need the opportunity to uh, witness, to friends that haven't known about their salvation experience. We need you to hold them close, Father, and make them aware that you are with them and that you will answer according to your purpose for them, Lord, and the ultimate purpose is that your name will be exalted and glorified. What an honor it is to lift you up in prayer, Lord, and help us to remember to do that moment by moment, day after day. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to go back into Isaiah. I remember, I keep saying, Jesus will come before we get this done. <laughs> Which we all are kind of saying it's a good thing. So, um, therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, this sin will become, this sin will become for you like a high wall cracked and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces not a fragment will be found for taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. The first section of that verse 12 is the one that we need to focus on. It's one that is almost impossible for us to believe that anybody would despise his word. Yeah. It's very difficult considering he's talking to the Israelites. God is making a pronouncement against them. It's not that you don't like what you're hearing. Last week we heard they wanted the prophets to say nice things. Don't prophesy any bad things against us. We don't want any of the bad news. But God now addresses it to show the severity of it. You despise my word. How hard is that for us to think when we love his word? I mean, you're here, ladies, because you love his word. You wouldn't be giving up this time during your day if you didn't love his word. But there are people who hate it. In the world today, People hate the word, and we know that because they hate Christians who represent the word. Why would anyone hate it? Why did the Israelites hate it? Because they didn't like the message of truth that came through it when God points out their sin. We want that loving, good God who's going to bless us, heal us, give us the things we want, give us peace, make life pretty good. We can't have that God without the holy righteous God, can we? Because it's all the same God. So when Israel is doing things where they are obedient and God blesses them, instead of praising him continually, they begin to get complacent. Say, we're pretty good. Things are going well. And then they have the enemy come, and then they cry out to God, and he said, wait a minute. You're in this mess because I had to discipline you. They don't like that. None of us like discipline. However, discipline is necessary when we're disobedient in society, in the classroom, in spiritual life, to bring us back and get us on track. It's an absolute necessity, and it's done out of love by God. In society, it's done out of 
avoiding trying to avoid chaos. In the family, it's done hopefully to because you love your children, but you also don't want chaos. And you know what disobedience costs. It's costly to disobey the rules, whatever the rules are. But we know the history of Israel, don't we? God called them, and he reminds them over and over again. I didn't call you because we were a big, strong people. I called one man. He said, yes, his righteousness is his faith. And now I'm building this community of believers, and it's called Israel, through which I'm going to bring my son, which is the marvelous message that Isaiah gets to prophesy about. But here, when the enemies have been surrounding them, and God is bringing judgment. We've been reading through this a couple weeks. Now, God's bringing judgment on these nations. Israel's sitting back and saying, oh, good, they're going to get their comeuppance. And he said, okay, now my children, <laughs> here's yours. See, we discipline our own more than we would somebody else, wouldn't we? You know, when I discipline kids in the classroom, a few times when I have them alone, I may discipline them. I said, it's a good thing you're not my child. Because <laughs> I can do things to you I can't do to them. <laughs> you know, I, I can be more stern. But because God <clears throat> called them in the first place, they didn't pick him. So he can require of them anything he wants. Does that apply to us? Because he chose us? He can require of us whatever he chooses. But the benevolence of God is equal to his justice and judgment and his discipline. We get all of those equally. Sometimes, though, we're in a pattern in our lives where we see the discipline more because that's what we need. We are the ones who messed up, not God. So he's saying, you despise my word. That's an, you know, I don't like your word. That's different than you despise. That's the greatest kind of hate we can have, isn't it? Now, God could use any word he wants, and we know he's given this message to Isaiah, and it has been translated. What we know that is God protected his word. So when he used such a powerful word, despise, he wants us to understand how deeply they hated and resented his word. Total opposite of, let's say, what David did. We know David was a, a sinful man and did some really big sins, committed some big sins in our view, big and little. Okay. But he loved the word and he got into the word. He loved it because he knew it's what shaped him and formed him. And we have to love the word so we get into it. It will also discipline us. But when we don't want the word, when I don't have time because other things, you know, that's almost as if we're saying that it's not important. We may not despise it, but we certainly don't put it in the place it should be in our lives where it should be daily. So we are fed the word and hide it in our hearts. But this is the condemnation that he's bringing on Israel. So oh, as we go into this, think about how severe it is. And then he, he said, <clears throat> the truth is, it's because of the oppression and the perverseness of your sin that you aren't relying on my words. When we are praying for people, for whatever the thing is, one of the things that we do and that gives us hope is that we have some promises in the scripture we can rely on. Right? We're not grasping at straws and so, oh Lord, I hope you would hear my prayer. I hope maybe you can heal people. I hope these are true. I hope I'm not just saying vain words. No, we can pray based on the truths that we have in the scripture and then we always say, but your will because he's sovereign, that's what's gonna happen. But if I get angry at God and think, well, I'm not gonna bother with this. I've been praying, nothing's happening. I've lived a pretty good life, and you let this happen to me. Think how Joe could have talked. You know, and we, I've known Christians say it. Well, I've done everything right. I've done this, and, that, and then God lets this happen to my family. Ooh, that's dangerous ground, isn't it? <laughs> For one thing, we haven't done everything right. <laughs> we, we can't, even in Christ. We still sin. But he's just wanting them to see the depth of the choice they made. We are not good as human beings. Our race is not good at admitting we've been wrong. So often when we're caught in a wrong or accused of it, we begin to twist the facts. Well, you don't understand the circumstances. Or did you see me? You weren't there. Well, that's not as bad as we, 
always excuse ourselves. Israel did that too. They also kind of bask in the idea that we're your chosen ones. We can kind of get by with it. Who's supposed to be light in the world? His chosen ones. Israel at one point. Us now. We need to be living that life out to look so different from the world that people understand. Oh, they've been with Jesus. They might not like that. But some might say, oh, I need to talk to somebody that's been with Jesus because I need him. But the Israelites had such a terrible <coughs> witness toward Jehovah who had called them. And so that's what God is talking about here. And he said, there's not even a fragment left. When he gets done destroying, there's not even going to be a little shard left of pottery because of what you are doing. But he starts with the most grievous of sins, and that is despising his word, not wanting to listen to the warnings that the prophet gave. We are responsible to share the good news. We can't force people to receive it and hear it, can we? That's when we pray for the Holy Spirit to quicken their hearts and to open their ears, and he will draw them. But the ones that don't want it, the ones that hate it, are the ones that God will judge harshly because they had the opportunity, and we know what a great opportunity Israel has had and how God's blessed them. Okay, 15 through um, 17. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuits will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one at the threat of five and you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop like a banner on a hill okay. so who's speaking the Lord God okay who's speaking the Lord God of hosts the God of Israel that should get their attention right again calling them to task because of their disobedience because they don't like what God is permitting to happen to their lives now a side note on that we don't have to necessarily like what's happening in our lives okay. but we can't blame God we can't accuse him of being unfair or unkind we don't have to like it. Obviously, I don't like what's happening to my daughter. Moms, you know, if I could take it, I would. You take yours, okay? I don't like it. Has nothing to do with who my God is. And my daughter says it daily. It has nothing to do. See, we're not in that position that we think we are sometimes to say, well, God, you're being so unfair. Why did this happen to me? It should have happened to them. They, no. The Lord God of hosts has spoken. The one of the armies we've talked about when he talks about the host, the host of angels, those angel armies that he can call to come defend us and to protect us. But he's, he's still that God. He said, I have called you. And then he says, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. This is a subtle salvation message in the Old Testament that is the same thing that God calls us to do in the New Testament. In returning, okay, come back to me. We often think, if well, I, I do, and I know some of you do because we talk, think that if I were God, I would have been done with them. Mm. See, he tells them the condemnation, but then his love and his mercy and his grace starts to speak his come back to me and in returning you'll find peace now I want you to think about that word returning when we are called to come to Christ we are called to turn away from our life that we've lived aren't we and to walk into his life and to walk in salvation that's repenting when we turn away and leave it so basically he said when you repent and come back to me he's told them a number of times but just like the world today, 
they may hear it over and over again. Perhaps they don't want to hear it. They say, like the Israelites, don't tell us those things. We want to hear the good things. For us in this world, with the people, the crazy things that are going on in the world, but the fact that the world needs a savior, we can't minimize the message. We can't say, well, I know you're not as bad as some of those people. We still have to say you're a sinner because it starts with that because repentance won't happen unless I have something to repent of. Which means then I realize I can't fix myself so I need a savior. Those things are absolutely have to be shared if we want have anybody come to Christ. We can't just say, well, you're pretty religious. You've been trying really well. That would be like me when I go to Kenya and I see the women with her amulets and you know, the habits that they have from witchcraft and those things, I said, well, you're, you're pretty religious and that's good, you know. So, but now let me, you know, talk to you about some other things. No, you have to turn and leave this. And the last time, I think I told you, because it was such a sweet example. The last time I was speaking to a group of women and I was focusing on repent. They kind of like what we're saying. That's good news. That's a little better than what they have in their culture because they have nothing anyway. And the witch doctors aren't always healing people. So maybe I could add to it. So, and so we said, no, if you repent, which you must before you come to Jesus, you have to, and one of the things that women did, they chew tobacco and they always have the tobacco pouch. And they have their little, you know, amulets, their magic symbols. And I said, no, you can't keep those. If you're coming to Jesus, you have to give up everything. Is that what he called us to do? Leave everything and follow me. So some of them, they were looking. So they kind of were nodding and said, do you want to follow Jesus? And a number of them said, we want. I said, you can't hang on to those things. And the one little old Turkana lady who's about like this and skinny, they don't have much to eat and weathered up skin, you know, she stepped forward and she dropped her tobacco pouch in the center. And one by one, most of those women dropped those symbols, things, and walked away. So that's repentance. I give it up. I turn away from it. But they got it visually, and then they did it literally. But that's what Jesus is calling Israel to come back to me. Turn away and come back. Think about what they had walked away from. How much evidence did they have that Yahweh was the only true God? Their whole history points to that, right? The law and the prophets, we keep hearing about that. Isaiah reminds them, and God reminds them, the New Testament reminds them, you have the law and the prophets. I gave it to you first. Now it's come to the Gentiles. <laughs> so walk away from it. Don't hang on to those things. We tend to, in our culture, as well as what they did there, is to say, well, I can probably hang on to that, but I, I'll add to it. Okay, I, I might still want to go through all the rituals of my religion, but I'll believe in Jesus too. No, that's not repentance, is it? Repentance is I turn my back and walk away from my former life into my new life with Jesus. There's no compromises. He doesn't compromise. If he compromised, he wouldn't have had to be on the cross. Right? You are unwilling to, to turn and come back. We can't force somebody. Right? You cannot force people to do what they need to do. If you've ever tried to force if you had a stubborn child, you try to force them, they might have a tantrum, but you can't force them. There's only certain things you can force somebody to do against their will. I said, you didn't want to do it. Now, what he begins to address is what the problem that we always have, and this main sin problem, is we think we can do it. And so he said, you're saying this, no, we will flee on horses. We can get away from your vengeance, God. You're no, we can get away. No, nope. no, we, um, and we will ride upon swift steeds. And they continue through that passage talking about what we will do. Okay. Here comes the judgment. 
Here's God's plan of salvation. Here it is, people. No, we can. We can. I can. No, I got a plan. I can do this. I'll, I'll take care of it. It's the foolishness of man's heart and mind, isn't it? Because if we are honest and look at our world today, we can't say that mankind has learned how to fix the basic problems in our world. We have technology that blows our minds away. We can get to all the planets and the stars. They almost did that in Tower of Babel, right? We have wonderful medicines, I'm so glad. We have chemos that can heal us. We, we have to give compasses. But is our world an absolute mess? Can we go five minutes if you have the news on before there is another murder? Another horrendous act of cruelty to mankind? We have all these things we've done, but we can't fix the real problem because it's a sin problem and only Jesus can. It was no different in the Old Testament. But just as we in our world today think, look how far we've come. In some fields we have, but has it changed the problem that we see in the world? It's hard to think of a time in our recent history when there was so much violence permeated on other people. Granted, we can hear about 24-7, which we're more aware of. It's been going on. But it's, Satan is alive and well and trying to do more and more of his you know, dastardly deeds before Christ comes. But when we see the world that starts to excuse it away or think that we can fix it, every time one of these you know, incidents happen in the city, you start talking about the city leaders and the politicians get involved and they start thinking of all the ways we could fix it. Well, if they had better housing, you know, if we didn't send all those young men to prison, Okay, well, we aren't giving them enough food. We're not giving them enough counseling. We, we need to. We will ride on fast horses. We will, we will, we will. And we have failed miserably because we're not addressing the problem. Israel's the same. It's the way we're born, isn't it? In sin. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Well, we're finding out, aren't we? And aren't you shocked? I mean, we all are. I know, yeah, it is. I, I know man is wicked. But when we hear how wicked, but God isn't surprised by that wickedness. In fact, as we celebrate Easter, going to the season when Christ came to die and actually died for us, God sent his son right into the middle, knowing exactly how deceitful man's heart was, knowing exactly the kinds of evil we would perpetrate, even on his son. If there had been another way, God would have been cruel to send Jesus to die for us, wouldn't he? He couldn't be a loving father to do that. But instead, he, along with his father, loved us so much that Jesus was willing to suffer hell for us so that we could be in heaven with him. That, that's not even something we can comprehend, is it? We know it because we've experienced his love and mercy and forgiveness. We know it in our hearts, but in our minds, it's still a difficult thing to comprehend. But Israel had had so many opportunities to see God's mercy portrayed on them and their physical protection of them as a country. And then they dabbled in the practices of the heathen nations. And we're doing that today. We're dabbling in the practices of everything around us as heathen. We're a very small group of elect believers, aren't we? Chosen elect, we won't get into that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. But the world hasn't changed. So as we read Isaiah, we see how applicable it is today because the world is still wanting to do their own evil things. So he said, you, you try to flee and get away, even though you know it's not going to 
do you any good. Okay. Once in a while when we would have gang fights, it's one of my favorite schools, <laughs> we would get the gang task force police officers alert in case there was a big fight. We had a huge, big front to our school building, and so you could have people all over the place, and you, you could have a, a mess. So the minute we sent the word, <clears throat> the kids tried, was, tried to start the fights, but here came the army. <laughs> they said, we will, we will. I said, no, you won't, because we've got people coming. We've got people coming to stop the chaos. Okay, God, I sent the prophets to stop the chaos to show you. You think you can get away with it, but you can't. God's watching. He's watching everything that's happened. No sin is hidden from him. No disobedience. No word that we speak is something that he hasn't heard. We think like Israel. Well, we got a plan. We can get. By. We can run off. We'll go. We'll sneak out the back door. Oh, I got a police officer out there too. Because I know where you're going to sneak off to. You know, human nature. We'll get away with it. And the reason we want to get away with it, whatever it is, in whatever time period we're talking about, whatever group of people, we want to get away with it because we want to be our own gods. That was Satan's problem, wasn't it? And that's the problem with mankind. And Israel just does a wonderful job of showing us <laughs> how it doesn't work. But God is calling on us. Say, okay, you guys, this is what you guys are thinking. We will do this, we will do that. And if I were Israel, he said, how did he know that? We, so if we think about it, how did you know that? Because I'm God. <laughs> and I've got the army. And I'm going to bring it. And I'm going to bring the justice. Now, God is telling him, we know, I know how you're going to act. You have to return. If you return, we're going to be. And now, as we see it throughout Isaiah, we have this awful judgment that is coming because they will not repent. <coughs> and then God wants to be gracious to them again. It hurts God's heart so much to have to discipline his children. I'm sure some of you said like I did and like your mother said and you said you would never say that, but when you were going to discipline your child, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. That's true, isn't it? Because of all the understanding we have of why they disobeyed and what it will take to keep them out of harm's way in the future, and it doesn't feel good. And if we look at our children that we love and we think, I've got to hurt you a little bit so that it doesn't get worse, God said, I've got to hurt you so that you don't destroy yourself. Bigger than that, he said, I'm going to hurt my son, and I'll turn my back on him. Because destruction is coming unless I fulfill my plan. And now we see that gracious message that Isaiah, and I keep bringing you back to this. If you're Isaiah, I say, okay, Lord, this is doom and gloom. I'm, I know. I need to say it. Can you tell me something good? <laughs> the good news is only good news if you realize you don't have any hope, isn't it? If I'm doing pretty well, I don't need you, thank you. I don't need your help. I got this. God, see me? I'm doing okay without you. Now, some other people may need you. But that's what our hearts say. Well, I don't need you. So this is what God is saying now. Hopefully I'm getting your attention. But he, it seems to me like sometimes God just can't wait to tell you how much they love you. Remember, go back to our children. Remember after discipline a child when you had to and how it hurt you and how things weren't right they were mad and you knew it would be a difficult dinner night because you had given them consequences or I was old fashioned when I, I spanked a few times <laughs> and you, you just wanted to get over that right are we good now are we good and, and in the human sense we said do you still love me you know God knows we still love him but you know we need to get on with it so God's gracious to you. Okay, let me tell you. Let me tell you some really good news. And that's what I want you, Linda, to read. And uh, Yet the yeah. Lord longs to be gracious to you. Mm. He rises to show you compassion 
for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes you will see them. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Okay, let's stop there. There's t that's jam-packed full, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> is it? And I love when we have so much you can hardly absorb it all. But again, I want you to, if we can imagine what it might have been like when God is so eager to share all this with his people and to reassure them how much they are loved and how much he wants them to walk in the straight and narrow path and let him lead them so that he can pour out all those blessings. Like, I've got a room full of blessings here. Just get your act together so I can give them to you. You know? I mean, in the human sense, but in a greater sense, this is the God of the universe, the God with a host of armies, the God who's sending his son to be our propitiation. He's waiting to lavish us with all of his gifts. And we understand what a great word lavish is, but this is what he's trying to help us. <clears throat> he longs to, longs to. God's heart wants to do this for you. He cannot when we're out of relationship with him when we're defying him. He cannot do it, but he wants us to know that this is, you know, this is desire. Who is this God? Some little insignificant person, some big daddy in the sky that's something, no, the God of the universe, the sovereign, holy, righteous God. He said, I, I have got so many blessings I want to give you, but I can't give them to you when you're in disobedience. But my heart is still longing to be able to bless you with every good and perfect gift, which we know comes from him. But the relationship matters, doesn't it? And he can't do it until we get, you know, get our act together. He said, but I, I want to do this, and I <clears throat> want to get you out of the adversity that you're in, the mess that you have made for yourself. I want you to start to hear this is the right way, walk in it. We understand that the right way is narrow, isn't it? So we're walking the narrow way, but we see in the peripheral vision this big broad path that everybody else is going down. It seems pretty interesting. I mean, you know, why can't I go over here? And why would I stay on the narrow way? Well, God has instructed us both in the Old Testament and the New as to why we need to do it. The consequences for getting on the broader road, Israel has already suffered numerous times. But God chides them and then gently reminds them. I'm not done. With, I still have blessings. I'm not done with you yet. You know, you can get to the point where an obstinate child is, that you may say, I, I'm done with you, at least for a while, because you're not listening, you're not listening. But that doesn't change the fact that you love them and you want them to come back so that you can lavish them with your love again and give them all their rights of inheritance. But your love also declares that I can't do that while you're not following me. Can't go together. But I want to give you this. I want to give you this. I mean, that's God that says that to his children. And yet sometimes the children say, I still kind of want to do it my own way. You know? Then when they come back, God is gracious to them. But that means, and he spoke in the earlier passage, returning, that repentance has to come. You can't get those blessings apart from you're repenting. That's the stickler, isn't it? Because anytime we repent, that means we admit we did something wrong. Boy, 
That's hard. It's hard for all of us because Satan wants us to believe the lie. But you're not all that bad, folks. You've got a lot of pretty good things. Now, in the way we see the world today, and because of what we can see 24-7, it's really hard to think anybody thinks we're any good. <laughs> you know, even non-believers, they have to start wondering about the, you know, the mentality of the world. He said, <clears throat> but he says, we're going to get to that point. And then in verse 22 through uh, 28, Linda. Um, then when you defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold, you will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. He will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground, and the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In that day your cattle will graze in broad meadows. The oxen and donkeys that work the soil will eat fodder and mash, spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days. God starts to tell him how it's going to be. And it sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Now, have they ever experienced this before? Mm -hmm. Yes, they have seen his blessing. They have seen him give them manna and food to eat when he brought them out of Egypt. They disobeyed later, but they came back, and they disobeyed, and they, they come back. We have that roller coaster ride that they're having with. But he said, at this point, when you start to really see the big picture, you will begin to say, I'm going to give up my idols. How in the world did Israel get idols? God said, I am. I am the one true God. I am the only God. Abraham realized there was only one God. He left his idols and followed him. The thing that set Israel apart and that made nations upset with them is they believed in one true God. Jehovah, Yahweh, God Almighty, the I Am, the only God. Everybody else around them, as today, have more than one God and not a true God. Okay. Because it when I bless you and when things get back to normal, you're going to want to get rid of those idols. Think how foolish they will begin to feel when they realize we listen to all those voices in the world and we fell in step with them. Because falling in step with the world sometimes is easier than being the odd man out. Look at them. Look at them. The early church, you know, was punished because they weren't like everybody else. When some of them were arrested, they, they couldn't quite come up with a charge for them, so they just said, you know, they did with Jesus. <laughs> Good charge, right? I don't know what to say. They did with Jesus. But they weren't following the gods of the world. Now, this is an important aspect of this. In those countries that surrounded Israel and still surround them today are the remnants of them. They have different names and so forth. While Israel was the only one that worshipped the one true God, did all those other nations worship the same gods? Oh, but that's okay. You're my neighbor and you have a couple gods and you're her neighbor close to me and you have not the same gods and you have, oh, but that's okay. We won't, Lord, don't, don't worry about that. I don't care how many gods you have. It's only when there's one true God that anybody has a problem. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Wait, wait a minute. Is that true? Hey, oh, I think that's true. The only people that have a problem with are the ones who agree that everybody else has one God. Okay. Now, the exception to that in today's world and in when it's since again, is the people that believe uh, in Islam. And, and they believe, and they have a strange twist on our religion. They believe just in Allah, period. They think we are polygamous, have, you know, have three gods, God the Father. And they'll tell you that when you're talking to them. They say, well, yeah, but you worship three gods there. Now, the problem with their God is, is he's impersonal. Okay. 
but they're the only other religions that tend to have just the idea of, of one God. But all the other nations have many gods, and they're kind of, it's fine. And some of them have the same gods or truth, but they have more than one. They just add to them when it's convenient. Yeah, our God's alive, and they're, and they're not, and, you know, the idols, and God tells them over and over again, the idols are things you made with your own hands. Why would you worship something you created with your own hands? Why do they have more than one God, even though, the, you know, they die off? And, well, they, if you can create your own gods, it's convenient. If I think I don't like my God or he's mad, I mean, like the Romans and the Greeks, you know, they have lots of gods who interfered with your life. Unless they liked you that day, then they would be on your side. And they kind of dwelled in the heavens and spirits. But, to, but the main thing that's different, uh, that God asserts himself in all this, he's always been. And then he allowed his son to die and be raised again because he's eternal too. And we are eternal. People don't like that idea because it's sort of a fantasy. But yet, when we see that they make up their own little gods and think they can do any good for them is beyond, you know, that's a fantasy. Yes. You see, you don't have to know much about your religion to say you reject it. <laughs> and you can still say, we believe there's going to be a Messiah someday. I said, well, wouldn't you go to the book that talks about the Messiah? You don't have to go to the New Testament. Go to the Old Testament. Your scriptures. It talks a lot about it. Okay. It talks about the shedding of blood. You know, and of course, Jesus talks about he would die and, and be raised again. But you see, those are the things that if people believe, Satan's threatened by them. So he causes people to believe the delusion which is more convenient. Okay. We went to a, a which country? Yeah, Saudi. We saw a, a funeral for a Muslim that had died. And they were doing their, on their rugs, praying, blah, 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 blah. and we had a Muslim guy talking to it. And so we asked, and he said, ask whatever questions you want. He said, is he going to heaven? <laughs> Where is he going? I said, well, they don't know yet. How would that? How you like that idea? Mm -hmm. I'm on my deathbed. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going. I'll I'll be scared. I think I'd be. I probably would say, well, anybody else have a better idea than what I've been taught? <laughs> you know. Yeah. But again, when you talk about the Jews, and the Jews are really bad about thinking they get brownie points, <laughs> kind of idea. They were too. It depends on how good. The problem is always when you any group of people, any religion that believes that, they don't know what the standard is. But God sets the standard, it's perfection. <clears throat> We're not gonna make it. When I was trying to explain this to my Tacona sisters, um, I drew a line in the sand, and I got way back, way from where I couldn't possibly jump to the sand especially with my long missionary skirt. So, so I tucked it up and I took a running start and I tried to get there and I, I couldn't get there. And so then I tried again to get there and again. And I said, am I close? And they would cheer me on. I said, but I can't get there. I gotta do one of two things. I gotta figure out how to meet the mark or I've gotta move the mark. The mark is perfection for God. How good can you be? 99.9 .9 doesn't count. Okay. But the standards in whatever religion you're talking about are man-made. And they don't even know that Jewish friend, you know, our Muslim friends, our Buddhist friends, or acquaintances, people, they don't know in this life if they're meeting the mark. I just don't know how they have a happy life at all. Because I would be so worried, I mean, I'll probably mess up today. Or, you know, you'd think, oh man, I really blew it. Today, I'm glad I'm, well, I'm not going to die today, so maybe tomorrow I can get better? And how would you know if you're better? How good can you be? You know, so, um, but the idea of a triune God, of course, is something that they don't understand at all, because that does look like we have more than one God. But when God is calling the Israelites back to them, he's reminding them that he has been with them forever. He has given them all the indication that they need that he is the one true God. The evidence is out there. If you want to ignore it, 
that's at your own peril. And God said himself, he said, the heavens declare my glory. You can decide whatever you want about how they got there and why the tides do what they do and why the sun comes up in the morning and, and the Romans and the Greeks all figured it out, but, you know, and uh, they're crazy ideas, fun stories, but <laughs> crazy notions. Because we know that there's something greater than us if we live. Because not one of us this morning had to stop and think, okay, first thing I do is set up. Now what do I do next? We just automatically get up and move. Why? Because that's how our bodies are created. Now, it's a little harder sometimes. <laughs> but, but see, those things that we do naturally, I mean, that talks about a wonderfully created person that God made in his image. But they want to deny all the evidence. And there's nothing we can do about a person who wants to deny the evidence. We just have to keep, uh, keep sharing the gospel and, and then they'll be convicted. Okay, so uh, I want you to think about how they say to the idols, away with you. They're done with the idols. And that's what the Turkana women were doing. Getting rid of the idols, the things that got in the way of, of serving Jesus. Throwing them down. Realizing, I can't have these anymore. Because if you just keep one. One little idol, one little sin, what's going to happen? It's like <laughs> yeast. Yeah. One little rotten apple will ruin the whole bag. Okay. All right, go ahead, Linda. Yeah. Um, I'll start at 22. Yes, thank you. Then you will defile your idols overlaid with silver and your images covered with gold. You will throw them away like a menstrual cloth and say to them, away with you. He will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground, and the food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will graze in broad meadows. The oxen and donkeys that work the soil will eat fodder and mash, spread out with fork and shovel. In the day of great slaughter, when the towers fall, streams of water will flow on every high mountain and every lofty hill. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter, like the light of seven full days when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he afflicted. We're seeing like a glimpse into paradise, aren't we? The perfect world. Now, we've not had that in our world. Israel didn't have it there. <clears throat> so part of this is future prophecy. However, some of it is reminding the people of Israel is that when you followed me, when you were obedient, you know, you did have a land flowing with milk and honey. You did ha have your many, many cattle. Your crops grew. You were able to feed yourself. Those productive things, because I promised to take care of you as my people. I gave you all those things. In the future, we will have those things, and they will be absolutely perfect, because it will be heaven on earth, the paradise. But he's talking about how this happens. It doesn't happen, though, until we get right with our Creator, with our Maker, with our God. So he's reminding them that they have to come back to what they left. And they left it, didn't they? They chose to walk away. God never left them. Have you ever had somebody when they're going uh, through something, and they said, well, God seems so far away? You know, and that old cliche, guess who moved? God never removes himself from us. He indwells us. We cannot not be in God's presence always. So that's impossible because of who he is. Now, whether we want, to, why we put ourselves in a position to always be aware of it are some choices we make. Staying in fellowship with him through prayer and reading the scripture, fellowshipping with other believers so we remind ourselves of who we are in Christ and we're part of a body of believers, all those things. So, or we can decide, I'm not happy with the way God is working right now, so I'm going to ignore you, God. And we do that at our own peril, as Israel did, as a nation. We can do it as individual believers. But is God always with us? I can't say I'm going to leave you. Don't walk away. No. He goes with us. Always. But that's the wonderful promise of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? 
He indwells us forever and ever and ever. And when he gave us his spirit, when he was telling the disciples that I'm going to go away and you're going to be sad, but trust me, it's going to be better when the Holy Spirit comes. It's so much better because did the Holy Spirit indwell anybody in the Old Testament? No. The Spirit hadn't come as it did on Pentecost. Isaiah had the Spirit resting upon him, giving him visions, giving him words to write, but he didn't indwell him. We look forward to that. So, remember when crazy King Saul called David in to play for him because he kind of loony? And sometimes the Spirit of God would rest on Saul and sometimes it wouldn't. It would rest on him, not indwell him. Rested on the people of Israel, even the prophets. The Spirit indwells us. We can't get any closer to God now. And we'll never get any closer than we are. We'll see Jesus in some form when we get to heaven. I think we'll see the scars in his hand. I don't know what God will look like. It's the spirit, you know. That. But ladies, we can't get any closer. One of the hardest things on me right now is that I can't get close to my child and hug her. In my mind, in my heart, am I doing it? You bet. But can I physically do it right now? No distance separates me. No distance separates us from God, ever. That ought to make us jump and shout hallelujah and all kinds of things that we just kind of don't do in Presbyterian churches. <laughs> but maybe we should. I mean, this is amazing, fabulous, wonderful, mind-boggling news, isn't it? Where is your God? Right in here. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Did he mean that? I will never leave you or forsake you. You may not ever, not even want to mess up. <laughs> because he dwells in here. That's the wonderful promise that we have in the Holy Spirit. But the good news was that in the Old Testament, in Isaiah's day, and for his prophecy, he said, you know, you can have the Spirit leading you and giving you shelter and helping you to grow your crops and, you know, all of those things that you need so much. It's just different than now, but it's no less important. Now, so in verse, read 27, and we'll just delve into that for a minute. See, the name of the Lord comes from afar, with burning anger and dense clouds of smoke. His lips are full of wrath, and his tongue is a consuming fire. <clears throat> okay, do you want to run into that, God? <laughs> no. Okay. Now, God is pro promising his people and being gracious to his people. Here are the blessings. But then he goes back to, this is what I'm going to do on your behalf. Who fights for us? Who fights the enemy for us? Who's defeated the enemy for us? This isn't our battle. It's already been won. We need to take hold of that. But look at the God that fights for us and the God that was fighting for Israel. The words are so vivid. The name of the Lord. The, the reason that it is so sinful and that it hurts us so much for people to take God's name in vain because it is at his name the speaking of his name that demons tremble and it is at his name one day that every knee will bow whether or not they believe him as savior they will bow because his name has to be exalted at all costs, God honors his name. His name is exalted. That's one of the most important reasons we know we can trust him. Because his name will be exalted. An amazing caveat to that is that we can exalt his name in prayer and praise. And we ought to be doing it. We probably ought to do it more in the dark times than the good times because it's easy to praise when everything's good, isn't it? It's harder to praise. For all of us, we've been there. And when things don't make sense. But his name, it is it the name of Jesus. And we know the demons tremble. Because see, the demons understand what the world doesn't know. He is in charge. 
They're just still trying to be. <laughs> but they know they're defeated. <laughs> you think, are you guys fully? Yes, of course they're foolish. They're sinful guys. They might be girls. So probably nothing binary. What's that word? They're debating what they are, the demons. <laughs> but what we know. <laughs> but look, the, the Lord comes from afar. But how pleasant is the old oh, burning anger? Dips clouds of smoke, his lips full of wrath, his tongue's a consuming fire. It is not a good thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Our God is a consuming fire. He tells us that in several passages. What Isaiah is being told as he prophesies to the people is the hope this is the God that's coming for vengeance on your enemies. This is the God that has overcome our enemy, Satan. This is the God that fights for us. We don't need to get our own chariots and horses, do we? Our God is in charge, and he's a consuming fire. While that is good news for us as believers, because we see what that indicates as he fights for us, we need to also not take it for granted and tremble in his presence with awe and reverence because of everything that he is and that he allowed us to come into his presence in reverential awe, not trembling with fear because that consuming fire is not us. That debt's been paid. There's no condemnation to them who believe. There's no wrath for us, but for those who don't, that wrath is coming. It was being poured out on the nations. It, it, Isaiah's day, and it still is today, and I think as we go through the study, we see all the things that are happening in the world today. You know, we can be pretty certain that this is God's judgment on people, isn't it? Unfortunately, there are some Christian leaders who sometimes try to explain it uh, on television and then it gets twisted or turned and makes it look foolish because they don't necessarily use the right words and help people understand. But what we know that is God is not only a God of grace and mercy and forgiveness, but he's equally, and he must be for those things to matter, a God of vengeance, justice, righteousness. And whenever he meets out judgments to people, as he has throughout nations in history, he is doing it now, and we see it acted out. I believe the things, the trials, if you will, that our nation is going through, the, the unimaginable things that are happening within the United States, God is bringing judgment on a people who's turned their back, just like Israel did. You know, we're not the same as Israel. You can't equate to the United States. But he has blessed, he has blessed, he blessed England for years, and Scotland and Ireland. They took the gospel. You know, we just celebrated St. Patty's Day, and for whatever you know about him, he was truly a missionary. And Ireland was in his home. He called to go tell the heathens, heathens about Jesus. He was a godly, righteous man. And now we honor him in a way that's kind of, he would probably tremble if he knew. Okay, but, that, <laughs> but the United Kingdom at one time was a lighthouse, a beacon of light. And so were other countries. And now we see what's happened to them. And I think we're seeing, you know, God uses another country. We can send missionaries to the ends of the earth from our country. But so are other countries now because we have failed to do what we have been enabled to do because of God's grace on this country. And Israel suffering the same thing. But as we see what's going on in the news today, just that is part of God's judgment, and it will continue until the final judgment when everybody will give an account for what they did with Jesus. And they will come up lacking if they can't say, I confess him as my Lord. There won't be. So we'll hold on a minute. I did all these good things. There are good things that are done by organizations, and we're glad that people do them, and some of them are worth supporting to make sure that people get fed and hungry. But if you just give them a piece of bread that they will eat, or that might go stale before they eat the rest of it, and don't give them the bread of life, we have not really done them much good, have we? Because everything's eternal, and for us, especially as we look to Resurrection Sunday, an empty tomb. It's eternal business we're about. And so was Isaiah. 
even though he didn't know, he knows it now. I thought, oh, he must have had a lot of aha moments when God took him home. Okay, I'll wrap up a couple more here. Um, let's see. Do uh, 28 through 30, Lyndon. His breath is like a rushing torrent, rising up to the neck. He shakes the nations in the sieve of destruction. He places in the jaws of the peoples a bit that leads them astray. And you will sing as on the night you celebrate a holy festival. Your hearts will rejoice as when people go up with flutes to the mountain of the Lord, to the rock of Israel. The Lord will cause men to hear his majestic voice, and he will make them see his arms coming down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudbursts, thunderstorm, and hail. The voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his scepter, he will strike them down. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing rod will be to the music of tambourines and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. Topheth has long been prepared. It has been made ready for the king. Its fire pit has been made deep and wide with an abundance of fire and wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of burning sulfur, sets it ablaze. That's a description of God, isn't it? In all his power, all of his majesty, his judgment. Okay. And those are images, of course. Now, literally, I don't think we're going to see literally God with fire coming out of his mouth. But he can cause the fire to come out of his mountains. He can cause the fire to come out of vehicles. I mean, he can bring destruction about, and wars bring that kind of destruction. And if you're trying to write it and explain, how can I describe this? you use different kinds of imagery. But if you're trying to describe God, and God himself is giving Isaiah this description, he wants us to understand, what could I see? Okay, this God comes down, and there's a fire that's going to consume the enemy. Okay. And how huge it is. And you can't get away from it. It is so powerful. And why is it powerful? Because the name of the Lord. He goes back to that. And he's going to be destroying all the enemies. Again, this part of this chapter is talking about how God is going to protect his people, Israel. Some of that is yet to come. Now, we know that many prophecies in the Old Testament are fulfilled within the lifetime of the prophet or within maybe a couple hundred years where nations are destroyed. And many of those nations are gone. You know, Some of it is both... It's going to happen fairly soon. It's going to be on steroids at the end times when we're going to see God's destruction of the nations because that destruction is coming. Okay. But the good news is for Israel is for God to remind them, I'm the one that's fighting your battle, and you can't get any bigger and stronger than me. The psalm said, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. That name again, you see? And see, the God, whose name we trust, he can muster all the chariots he wants us. And all the horses, he, he can whistle them down. And here they come. And sometimes he's used that phrase, and here they come, to crush the enemy. Literally, you, they can come. But they come at his bidding because he's totally always in charge. That's the point that God wants Israel to hear from their prophet Isaiah. How powerful is this God you are calling us to return to? Remember when we started? Return to me. Come back to me so that I can graciously bless you. And in blessing you, I can protect you. That's what he says to us, too. Don't get out of fellowship with me, because I yearn to bless you and to be with you. It will